little bit of room because I can tend to project. Um, one thing that I've enjoyed so much about global breakdancing competitions is this is a competition that happens uh, uh, all over the world, uh, in Korea, in Germany, in France, and this is the end of the competition. They go on for about three or four days. These crews of breakdancers compete against each other and eventually have a breakdance battle that decides who is the best crew. And that, as a form of conflict resolution, is one of the most interesting things that I can imagine. Imagine, imagine, if we can think about these global conflicts that we've been in right now, and some of them you've been thinking about a whole lot. Imagine if these kinds of global conflicts were resolved with breakdancing competitions. People doing insane things with their bodies. And somebody says, you, this is, uh, right now, this is Korea versus the Netherlands. Jesus, they're fucking good. Um, and, and, so, and at the end of all of this, they decide that you are the best break dancers. You are the ones that are worthy of the trophy. Uh, on the left there, you've got uh, Jinjo, uh, and they are from Korea. Um, one thing that I learned recently, oh, yes. Okay. Oh, 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 oh. Now I'm Britney Spears. Now I'm Britney Spears. This is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, one thing that uh, I learned recently is that um, uh, Korea, um, two things that are very, very, very popular in South Korea are um, breakdancing and, world, er, and uh, StarCraft. And the, two, and the reason why those two things happen to be really popular in youth culture is that if you are a South Korean boy between the ages of like, I think it's like 17 to 23, uh, conscription, uh, military conscription is not optional. You have to pick up a, a rifle and defend yourself from North Korea. There are two exceptions, which is that you're really good at StarCraft or you're really good at breakdancing. And if you're good at either of those two things and you compete globally, you actually can avoid military conscription. As it so happens, some famous Korean senators have sons that are both really good at StarCraft and really good at breakdancing. Just a coincidence, I'm sure. Can't moments away. You know, the thing that uh, I'm always worried about at this particular moment in time is that you're all going to be seeing this stuff on the screen and you're going to be seeing incredible, incredible, incredible feats of athleticism. And then it's me. <laughs> it's like, well, what do you got, Lemon? Well, a little bit of, a little bit of top rock. I don't know. If you are uh, interested in more of this, uh, two competitions I would recommend uh, checking out, uh, mostly on YouTube. Uh, one is called Battle of the Year. This is this global competition that's fantastic. The other one is called Street Star, which takes place every year in Stockholm. Um, and that they actually break into different groups. So, for example, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a um, whacking competition. Uh, there's also a runway competition. And the runway competition is repeatedly won by a dancer by the name of Long Legs. Who'd have thought?
All right. I am going to call that. I'm so sorry. Once again, uh, you go to yourself on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, look up Street Star uh, or, uh, or Battle of the Year, and you're going to find some really amazing shit. Uh, this is Flying Steps versus Squadron, another great battle. Um, I, no, I did not mean to click play on that one. Um, I also would point out, uh, this was from Street Star. This was the uh, um, uh, dance hall competition. Uh, also really love. But hi, how's it going? How's it going? Are we doing okay? Ooh, wow. Okay, okay, okay. It's after lunch. I get it. I get it. I get it. And NDC has been feeding us uh, pretty well uh, for days. And so, and I get it. We're, we're down to the end. This is the second to the last uh, talk of this time. But like, I'm going to try to give you a little bit of energy. I would like to just start off with a little bit of energy back, if that's okay. So let's try this one more time. How are we doing? I will absolutely take that. Thank you so much. My name is Lemon, and I make websites. Uh, I've been making websites for uh, over 20 years now. Uh, I just started a uh, new job um, as the uh, lead developer uh, for a com uh, company in North Carolina called Savas Labs, uh, teaching other people how to use CSS, and none of them have liked it so far. So we're going to learn together how to enjoy CSS. But I have been making websites for a long time. Uh, some of them um, I'm very proud of. Uh, some of them I would personally never own up to. Uh, but I have made lots and lots of websites. And when I do that thing, I use a whole bunch of different technologies. I tend to use Pug. Anyone here use Pug in here? Anyone? 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 Uh, Pug is a HTML precompiler. I think it's really nice. Uh, it's indentation-based, kind of like, uh, like Python is. It's just a way to write HTML a little bit faster. So if I have the option, if I have that freedom, I do like to write things in Pug. I also write almost everything in SAS. Uh, I think SAS is really great. Uh, SAS is just an extension of CSS. You can use SAS normalization uh, in CSS. Uh, CSS has the ability to have variables, uh, which is great but they don't quite yet have nesting and for loops and functions and stuff like that. So I tend to use uh, SAS a lot. I also use Vue. Um, of the three major ones, uh, that was the one that I found the most sort of the way that I like to write code. Uh, Angular and React, also very good. Uh, but Vue is kind of the way that I thought. So I tend to write in that language as well. I also sometimes use Ember. It's never my choice to use Ember. It's not even the most popular choice anymore, um, but it still is pretty good. I will sometimes use Microsoft.net. Um, this is, you know, a primarily .NET conference, and I get that. And if somebody says, you know, we're going to slang out some some uh, some C sharp here, uh, you're going to write some Razor. Fuck it, yeah, okay, let's do it. But if I uh, have another uh, opportunity, for example, doing a uh, CMS kind of situation, uh, a CMS like, for example, uh, Kirby, uh, Grav. Uh, Statamic, any of those cool flat file CMSs. And by the way, if you want to talk to me about flat file CMSs after that, uh, I do love that subject as well. Uh, but so I tend to write PHP when I'm doing that. Uh, sometimes, and not that frequently anymore, because SAS covers a lot of these things, but there's something called Bourbon. And so I use Bourbon sometimes as a way to kind of like have easy mix-ins to kind of like do a function in SAS that I want to use. And so again, I don't use that quite as much anymore, but I do sometimes use Bourbon uh, or beer. Or, or gin. Um, but other than those two fake ones uh, that I invented there at the end, uh, these are all languages that I tend to use. But those three, all of these languages up here, they all compile down to the thing that matters in web development. The only three things that matter in web development are HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. I don't care what you write, unless you're writing like React Native or some shit. If you're doing if you're doing web development, you are always coming down to these three languages. It's always HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. And this is the one that we're going to be talking about right now. So this talk, of course, is called I'm going to make you stop hating CSS. And show of hands here, show of hands, I just want to see how many of you would say, if you raise your hand, uh, how many of you would say that you hate CSS right now? OK, all right, I like that. I like, can we keep those up? Can we keep those up? I love that. OK, that's great. That's great. OK, here's what I'm going to promise you. Here's what I'm going to promise you. I don't think that every one of these hands is going to go down, but I think a number of them are. Because CSS, of course, no. <laughs> CSS is not easy. Uh, if you're familiar with a guy by the name of Dave Rupert, uh, the co-host of a show called Shop Talk, uh, uh, Dave Rupert has said, CSS is really easy. The only thing you need to do is remember 17,000 key value pairs, and then you've kind of got it covered. CSS is not easy, but CSS is great. It really is a great language. 
And so I want to think about like some of those things that you've been in contact with when you're trying to like, you know, learn about CSS and you get into the GIF that you'll find on Slack. And you've probably seen this GIF before. I feel like every single one of you has seen this GIF before. And I'm going to say, I get it. I get it. Throughout the course of this talk, I want to go through some of, the, some of the points that get you into this particular thing. And I want to get you to this GIF, because this is what I think about when I think about CSS. We're going to take that thing. You give me your HTML that I think is not written very well, and my CSS is actually going to fix that thing. So our agenda today is we're going to go through uh, three different things. We're going to go through the things that are weird. CSS is weird. It is an ever-changing spec of language. So there are weird things in that language. But also, there are things that are great. There's things that are great in CSS. And then we're going to close this out with things that you can try right now. Water. So with that said, let's get weird. Uh, the hocus pocus, uh, focus, um, and we're going to get weird. And one of the first ways that we're going to get weird is with something that you might have had to written right before, and that is overflow. Uh, overflow is a CSS property that's really, really part of every Lego that you're looking at. And the way that you're going to be thinking about overflow is with another graphic that I'm sure you've seen before. And again, I get it. I super duper get it. Because this is something that I can write in CSS. And in fact, here's what that looks like right now. I've got my box. Uh, my box, I'm going to give a border of 0.1 EM. Uh, 1 EM would be a relative unit to the measurement itself. Uh, so that's 1 tenth of essentially an M space. Uh, then I'm going to make that white. I'm going to give that a width of four characters. Uh, and I'm going to give that a padding. And then if I go ahead and just give that this HTML, then I end up with that. OK, well, that's cool. We've now reproduced the problem. So what can we do to fix it? Well, there's actually a couple things that we can do to fix this. So let's try the first way. So the first way, the most easy way, the most basic way, sometimes the right answer, sometimes the wrong answer, but we can just say overflow hidden. And if we say overflow hidden to that box, then what we'll actually end up with is CSS is awesome. OK. I mean, I feel like we solved a problem, but I don't think we solved the problem. This is not the solve that we were looking for. So we don't actually have to go overflow hidden. We can go overflow hidden in an x, y axis. So if we give this thing overflow y of hidden, then that means that uh, there's a y axis and there's an x axis. And if we say one's hidden, we're saying by default uh, that the other one is not. And then that's going to give us CSS is awesome. That's clearly worse. OK, OK. If you, if you made this your web page, well, two, one of two things happened. Either I'm going to make fun of you for that not being so good, or you're doing a cool art project. And I'm going to be like, that's awesome, man. <laughs> Um, so that's probably not the right case, but uh, let's look at another property. And this is a case of uh, the age of CSS. This language is uh, quite old at this point. And so we've got a property called word break break word. Now, that's what I mean when I say that CSS is weird. <laughs> word break break word. That is awful. And everyone that was involved in the CSS working group has written a letter of apology to say, we wrote it that way, super sorry about it, but it's an additive language. It's not a subtractive language. So if that's a rule that exists, it continues to be a rule of exists, that exists because it has to run in every browser. So because word break break word was in the scope before, that continues to be the scope uh, in this case. And so that's going to give us that which is fine. I mean, OK. I mean. OK, let's keep going. Let's keep going. We've actually got text overflow ellipsis. Now, you'll see this in a lot of cases where, for example, you've got like your news article, and you want to do like some sort of a tweet length thing. And you'll go, like, here's some, here's some characters. And, and, and when you're done, I'm going to give you some sort of maximum width and do that a text overflow of ellipsis. We just give it that property. And in all these cases, I'm just giving it this one property. I'm just changing this one property. And that's giving us CSS is all. Not cool, not cool, not cool. Let's go back to our scope here. So we've got our box. We've got our box. And our border, of course, was part of the design. We've got our padding of 0 0.3. That was also part of the design. But we've actually got an explicit width here. 
People have pointed this out as a CSS problem, but in fact, this is not a CSS problem. This is the design problem. The design itself clarifies that the width needs to be three, three, 4 EM. Well, at that point, what is the box supposed to do? It either contains it or it does not. If we simply remove that thing, then we end up with this box, which is really what we were looking for in the first place. This is a design problem, as so many of these things are. And also, I do think that CSS is awesome. I got this original idea from uh, Brandon Smith on CSS Tricks. Uh, if you've never seen it before, it's a very nice site uh, with a lot of very good uh, CSS on it. But we're going to move into another thing called position. Uh, position is something that every div and every aside and every A is going to have something assigned to it. And it's going to be one of these. Does anyone know if I don't assign a uh, div uh, a position, uh, which one it'll end up with? Anyone got a guess? Anyone got a guess? No? Cool, because it's actually a trick question. Um, <laughs> the actual thing that you will have as a div from the start, if you do not give it a property, it has a, a position of relative. Now, relative, or sorry, of static. Now, static is actually very similar to relative, except for it's worse because it can't contain things that are inside of it. So, for example, we've got our position of relative, right? And this is what you would imagine like a div would look like. I've got a box, it's got a grid thing behind it, and I can go ahead and just scroll, and this thing is going to respond, you know, the way that we would expect to see a div. If we move on into, a, into position absolute, position absolute is going to be locked to the nearest relative container to itself. So for example, if you've got like a, a little card interface and you go like, I've got this button and I want this button to be in the top right of whatever my thing is, if I, if I assign the container to a position relative and I assign the little child to its position absolute, that is what's going to control uh, the position absolute uh, container. So if we scroll, we can see that, that that will take your top and bottom and left and right values that will fix to whatever container you put it inside of, which makes it very, very different than another thing called position fixed. Now, position fixed does not care about any containing element. It, the only thing that it's interested in is the viewport itself. So anything that you have, for example, if you're at your job next week and, you're, and somebody comes up to you and says, hey, what I want you to do is I want when somebody comes to the, the website, what I want to see is like one of those modals that's like, give me your email address. First of all, say no, because that's awful and nobody wants to experience that. And it's terrible, terrible UX. However, if they win that fight, if, if somebody threatens you to do that thing, you're going to do that with position fix, because no matter what, that is going to remain locked uh, to the, to the uh, window that it's a part of. Um, finally, uh, this is a fairly new class, and this is something that, or a fairly new uh, property, and something that people have been for a long time using um, JavaScript for, but you actually don't need to anymore. Position sticky is, is the middle point between a position relative and a position absolute. So what I can do is I can say to a position sticky element, I can say that I want you to have a margin top of, in this case, this would be about 200, and I want you to have a top of zero. So that means that our scroll actually works like this. Now again, this is something that we can do inside of JavaScript, but it starts to get kind of ugly because we can kind of have to control like scroll elements. The more you have JavaScript watching what scroll happens, the more kind of like weight uh, your page is going to have. A position sticky element by itself, by only giving it a top element and a margin element, we can actually just lock that thing to this. You can also do that with left and right, uh, top and bottom. Uh, anything you like. So then there's static. Now static is actually going to be the same thing as our, uh, our position relative. The only difference is that static does not control the elements inside of it. If you put a position absolute element inside of a position static element, it's not going to uh, bound to that box. So if we look at all five here, uh, we can see what all of those look like. They, they do all uh, scroll differently and have different actions. But then we can go back into our initial, uh, our initial value, right? We, so we had a div. We didn't give it any property, any positional property. And so it's got, uh, well, there's all five. Uh, yep, I think we covered that bit. But if we, uh, if we go into the actual static element that we have, we can see that static elements actually have some limitations. For example, 
If you've ever had that situation where you've got like a bunch of divs and like this one is supposed to be on top and you go, okay, uh, Z index nine. And it's like, no. Okay. Z index nine, nine, nine. No. Z index nine, 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 nine. When that happens to you, the reason is, is almost definitely that your static element cannot take a Z index. It will ignore that value. It will also ignore the values of top, bottom, left, and right, and it will not hold any absolute. So one would say that this element, this default, this default rule is actually worse, right? So then you would say, well, okay, so why does position static exist? And the reason is, again, this is an additive language, position static exists because it does. It was part of the spec and it will continue to exist. Now you can control this, but you need to know that this is going to exist. Now you could change that, right? You can change that with this simple value. We could say, hey, everything that exists at the very top of your, at the very top of your CSS file, we could say everything that exists, I want you to make all of those things position relative. And if you are writing all of your own code and you're not using any sort of like plugins or widgets or whatever, this is probably okay. The thing is, is that if you are using a widget, this actually will start to break because you're going to have some sort of plugin that's going to have some sort of absolute positional element that's not supposed to be inside of its container. So this is kind of dangerous. So instead, what I would recommend is when you're having those situations, when you're having that situation with the div where it's not doing what you want it to, where it seems to be responding badly, start by giving it position relative because that is going to fix so many problems uh, right off the gate. Uh, I wrote an article on this as well. The index is weird. Uh, but we're going to be moving into float. Familiar with float, right? Familiar with float? So when I think about float, that's actually not the way that I think about it. When I think about float, I actually think about it this way. This is, this is what float looks to me, like to me. And the reason why is that it takes some expectations that you're going to have, and it changes some of those expectations. So for example, uh, let's say that we've got an article. Now, this is markup that we kind of would expect, right? We've got an article element, and then we've got an image. We want that thing to float to the left. Maybe we've got a paragraph. Maybe we've got some like other stuff in there. And we, and we say, OK, cool. So now you're going to float to the left. And when float works, it's pretty good. This is actually what float was meant to do, right? We've got a picture of uh, Tina Belcher from Bob's Burgers. Uh, we've got, uh, this is uh, called Tina Ipsum. Uh, so it's just Lorem Ipsum, but it's quotes from Tina Belcher from Bob's Burgers. And this is all fine because we've got our text layer wrapping around this thing. However, we can take this exact same markup, change around these P tags and see something awful because this is the exact same markup concept except for our P tag has stopped. We've still got our float element and Tina's just hanging out there looking awkward, which is stylistically kind of valid, but probably not the way out that we were looking for. So that is not great. That's not great. And can you fix it? Yes, we can fix it. We can fix it. If you're working on an existing code base, here is a piece of code that probably exists inside of it. Here's some CSS you probably have inside of that. And that is this. So inside of every uh, HTML element, you have the ability to do a, uh, a before and an after. So I've got a div, and then I can say like a before could be like, um, you know, uh, a little icon. You know, if I've got like, for example, like a list element, and I've got my special little dot because the designer thought that it, we have a cool dot, we can do that in a before element. An after element, you can do something like, for example, the, um, the little like arrow forward, you know, for your link. Uh, that can exist inside of every single HTML element. Uh, and so what we have right here is a situation where, okay, so I've got my container. My container is going to be holding a float. And I know that that could suck. And so what I'm going to do at the end of that is I'm going to create a table that sort of only kind of exists, and then it clears floats. And if we give that exact same markup that we saw uh, this exact attribute, we actually will end up with this. This fixed our problem. Why? Well, OK. In order to do that, we have to do a little bit of magical thinking. Because that means that right here is a table that exists kind of in the nether realm. It doesn't take any space. It doesn't actually do anything. But it has rules to clear both the float left 
and the float right. So therefore, it gets to the end of our, it's got our uh, image that's got a float, it's got our paragraph that's, that's floating around the text, and then it gets to the table, it says, okay, well now I have a table, I'm gonna clear that float, and then things are gonna be fixed. So, I mean, we did it, right? So we did it, so why don't, now that we've got that fix in, let's just make a layout with floats, because now we can just make a layout with floats. It's really easy. I mean, for example, like Twitter did it. Uh, that's what Bootstrap was, was a layout made entirely with floats. And I think one thing that we've learned, especially recently, is that Twitter doesn't ever make any mistakes. So we're going to make a layout entirely with floats, and that layout will be uh, something that, you know, is the kind of thing that you would put on the internet, which is pictures of William Riker with quotes from William Riker. So here we've got uh, six different pictures of William T. Riker. Uh, for example, uh, we could cause a diplomatic crisis. He doesn't seem super bothered by that. Um, I, I, I enjoy this one uh, down here. This is the uh, Worf. Better than music, it's jazz. So here we've got a, a six grid column and, uh, and all of these floats worked, except for the reason why all of these floats worked is that I kind of cheated because what I did in this particular case was, I said, okay, so here's a Riker, and each Riker is gonna be floated to the left. I'm gonna give that a width of a calculated element. Now you do, you can always use this in vanilla CSS. You can use this anywhere you like. You can tell a browser to do math, and most of the time it'll get it right. Even Internet Explorer will be able to do math. So you can give something, for example, a width of 33% uh, minus 30 pixels, giving us that margin left and margin right of the 15 pixels for that gap in the middle. And then we've got this. Okay, so that is not great. Now, one of the things that happened here is that um, we've got our first uh, element here and that is taller than the next element, so then the next one floats, but it only floats to the nearest uh, container that we have. And so that's why, for example, if you've ever looked at the markup of Bootstrap, it starts to look weird because you've got containers, then you've got rows, and then you have to like be very explicit about how all of those things look. And that is fixable. We could fix this with floats, but it would suck. But fortunately, there is hope. I want to be selling you hope, and that hope is going to come in a couple of forms. One of those ways is grid. Uh, have any of you played with CSS grid before at, at all? OK, yeah, OK, 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 great. So we're going to be doing this exact same layout, our exact same Riker layout, and we're going to be doing it with uh, CSS grid. So the very first thing that we're going to do is we're going to say, OK, uh, I've got my grid container. And I want all Rikers to have a display grid, and I want those, that grid to have uh, three columns. In this rule here, what I've got is I'm saying I want three columns, and each of those will have one fraction, meaning one equal measurement of however much space you got. We'll get into fractions in just a minute. Then I can actually give that thing a gap. And having done all three of those things, now, um, we're done. That's actually all. That's actually all it took to do that entire layout. We've 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 legitimately finished. In fact, this is the way that I wanted to do this initially, where I said like, here's the layout that we're trying to make. This is the way I did it because doing this layout in Grid makes so much sense and is so reasonable. Everything that exists as far as like the Riker and his padding and like the text and whatever. Okay, that was some bespoke CSS, but the layout of the columns themselves was those lines of code. That's 288 bytes. So we're doing OK now. Now, when I, we looked at that grid template columns, uh, there's actually a couple of different things that we can give this. And so there's different attributes that we can throw at this thing because grid added some new measurements. And one of those things that it said was this FR. So for example, we can say, I want to do three columns. So I can do that as one FR, one FR, one FR, meaning I've got three fractions, right? We can do repeat three, one FR. That second example is basically just a nicer way to write uh, the first FR. We can also do something where we would say we can mix these cases. So we can say I've got three columns, and I'm going to have a situation where I've got maybe a sidebar, 
and then maybe I've got like, you know, a big old ad or something annoying, and then I've got, you know, whatever space is left over. The thing about FR that's really useful is that you can say whatever's left over. Also, you can mix these cases. So if you have, for example, um, you know, a, uh, a grid that's like four columns wide and you want something to take three of them, then your grid template column, three FR, one FR, uh, you're all set. You've also got the ability to do auto fill and auto fit, uh, which we're also going to be getting into. So an FR is going to equal a fraction, and I want to give you my recipe for a gin and tonic. Now, I am not a fancy man. I am just a regular old guy that likes to drink. And so my recipe for a gin and tonic is that I'm going to say that I want to have four ice cubes, I want to have one jigger of gin, I want to have tonic water of, you know, whatever's left over, and then I'm going to put it in a lime wheel. We can do all of this kind of stuff with grid because when we say that recipe, we, we can actually fit each of these glasses with the same exact recipe. So our grid template columns, we've got our 1FR, 1FR, and that's going to give us uh, this layout. So we've got uh, two columns here, and inside of all these two columns, we've got some drink recipes. Okay, I mean, fine, but you know, we kind of saw that example. We can get a little bit more complex than that. So we can say repeat four, uh, one FR. Now I want to do a four column layout, uh, each with a single fraction, uh, and that's going to give us this. Now this is the exact same markup as that first piece of markup. The only difference is that we've just changed that thing. We can take our breakpoints, for example, your desktop to mobile breakpoint, and just change what that initial opening uh, grid structure looks like. Changing only that thing, we can get to a completely different layout. We can do this. We can say that we're going to have uh, 200 pixels, then 1FR, 1FR. Now we've got, again, unequal measurements of different grid columns, and that's going to give us this layout. So now we've got a Long Island right there on the side. We've got our pina colada, our margarita. Uh, we can keep going like that. Neat, but we can actually do something without any breakpoints at all. So if we do, for example, grid template columns, uh, repeat autofill 210 pixels, what that's going to say is, I want you to fill this space. And a column is going to have a measurement of, in this case, 240 pixels. And I don't know how many columns that's going to be. You're the computer. You're the browser. You're going to figure that out. What I want to tell you is that I want a column to be 240 pixels, and you do it from there. So using just that instruction, we can actually get to this layout. Now, the cool thing about this is that, again, I haven't written any breakpoint for this. And so if I can stretch this thing down, then I'm still going to have my 240 pixels eating up all of that stuff, but it's just going to uh, break and create these new column counts, uh, depending on what works. Now, you might be thinking that's neat, except for you're looking at this bit on the, on the right, and you're going, OK, it's close. But definitely, like if I hand that in, if I show that to the client, they're going to be like, well, what's this shit on the side? Cool. We can actually get there as well. Because we can get there uh, with this one. So we're going to give this another property. And we're going to say, I want you to autofill this thing. And I want you to put this somewhere between 250 and 1FR as a min-max value. So now we're defining, I want this thing to be a minimum of 250. But you know, if you've got extra space, go ahead and fill that. And because we did it with an autofill, and we only gave it this one property, it's going to go, OK, well, I know that 250 pixels. I know that I'm going to measure it like this. And I also know that they're all going to be equal. So having done all of that, it'll actually look like this. And again, this is going to work without any breakpoints whatsoever. You're going to have this grid down to a phone or up to one of those weird-ass Michael Bay, you know, wide-ass monitors. It's going to have this kind of rule. But we can get even fancier with that. We can get even fancier with that. And I mean, Michael K. Williams, like what a, what a fantastic, what a fantastic actor. Um, he was even, did you ever see Trapped in the Closet? Like, that's how good Michael K. Williams was, was that he was in a movie that was written, directed, and starring R. Kelly, and he was still good in it. But anyway, we're going to get fancier. And with this thing, what I want to say is that I want to give this, this grid a, uh, a, a layout of four columns, uh, all of which are an equal fraction, 
Uh, and then I want to say to only my rum drinks, I want only my rum drinks to span two columns. And if we do those rules and those rules alone, then we actually get this structure. Because every time that we pull up any of these rum drinks, it's going to span two columns. So this starts to get really, really interesting because now you can say, for example, um, you know, if you've got sort of these, these like 11 column layouts given to you, and then like this thing is taking several columns, you can say, okay, we'll start off with an 11 column layout and all of those things are equal. And now I've got my big hero image. That's going to take seven of them. I've got my like small little infographic. That's going to take one of them. I've got another one that's going to take three of them. And those are all going to fit in like in the rules of themselves. And if we've got just this markup, which is really the markup that we've been looking at this whole time, we can actually do something that's even more impressive in my mind. So you can see here that in each of these cases, I've got uh, a figure and it's got a class of the drink itself and then the, uh, the glass that I'm putting that drink in. So I've got tulip glasses, I've got column glasses, martini glasses, uh, there's maybe another one in there. But what I can actually do to this thing in the child element is I can say, okay, wait, that was my uh, result of that. But in the actual child elements, I can say, okay, everything in a Collins glass, I want that to have an order of one. Everything in a martini glass, order of two. Everything in a tulip glass, everything in a margarita glass, order of four. Using only those properties in my CSS, I can take that exact same markup and not change any of it and order these things appropriately. Now, you would have to do so much annoying JavaScript to inspect and recompile and move these things around, especially if you want something that's going to be different on. This happens so often uh, in, a, in a mobile display where like, it's like this, except for like, when it gets down to mobile, then this thing goes above this. You'll have situations where you'll have to like, use JavaScript to like, rearrange these elements. With CSS grid, and this order property, you can do it just like that. And you can do that in a breakpoint. You can do any of that stuff. And I think that that's really impressive. There's one thing that I want you to note about that, is that this is the first time you're hearing about this order thing and you're excited about using it, you should be. It's cool. But if you do um, a, uh, a columns and you want to do an order, and so you give something an order of one, you'll now have to do it to everything because your base value, your default value, your undefined value is going to be a zero. So if you give something an order of one, that's going to come after everything else is undefined. So if you're doing something where you've got a column and you want to define some orders, don't stop. Keep ordering things, or if you have to, you know, give it negative values, although that can be a little bit weird. Um, so having seen some cool CSS, what I think is very, very interesting CSS, I think that we're all just, uh, fuck. It is the topic that's always going to be coming up um, in, in uh, uh, any conversation about newer or more advanced CSS. Now, obviously, we know the lifespan of Internet Explorer. We know that, for example, if you're on uh, uh, Windows 10 or Windows 11 and you try to open up IE, like IE itself will be like, don't open me. I'm no good. Uh, please, please, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for all the crimes I've committed under the world. Um, but you know, there's still people on older machines. You're still going to be, you know, trying to build stuff for people that are in their, uh, their cubicles at banks. And so you're still going to have these problems. But these are not as bad as you might think they are. Because if we can look at uh, can I use, and this is a screenshot I took just a couple of days ago, we've actually got in the Portuguese uh, uh, interface 98%. 98% of everything that I talked about here is actually supported uh, by all of, these, uh, all of these browsers by use. And you can look at some of these red boxes and go like, oh, no, there's red boxes, except for this is them listed by version. If you actually look at... Uh, distribution by popularity, well, that grid looks a lot goddamn different <laughs> because, you know, uh, Chrome's done so many good things, and, and I really do uh, think that it's an excellent engine. Um, it's a really good engine, but I will say that, like, when any piece of technology has this much market share, it's encouraging, but it's a little bit confusing, right? I mean, that's, that's a whole lot. Also, uh, I, I don't know if you're all aware of this, but uh, 
Have you ever opened up uh, Chrome on an iOS device? You ever opened up Chrome on an iOS device? OK, you haven't. Did you know that? Did you know that when you opened up Chrome on an iOS device, you actually didn't? You opened up Safari. You opened up Safari with a Safari engine and a Chrome logo because it is part of the Apple Terms of Service that any browser you open up in iOS is actually Safari. You can call it Brave. It can have the Brendan Eich kind of like stamp of approval, but it's actually always still going to be Safari. So a couple of takeaways from that is uh, if you're looking at IE uh, 10 and 11, which is less than 2%, actually significantly less than 2% now, uh, you're going to have uh, the same support as long as you can do some prefixing. Um, if you've got any sort of precompiler, your Grunt, your Gulp, your Webpack, or whatever, you're probably OK. If you're, if you're targeting now IE 9, OK, some of the stuff that we've looked at is going to have to have some fallbacks. But as so many big companies have figured out, if people are looking at your website in 2022 and they're looking at it in IE 9, they're actually used to it being weird. So if you give them a bad layout, it wouldn't stand out. And any other uh, lacking, there's got to be in a browser that's at least four years old, and that's just not really feasible with all of these auto updates. Um, but there's also Flexbox. Uh, and Flexbox is uh, a slightly older spec and so actually has slightly better support. Uh, that is an old screenshot. I'm so sorry. But, um, but uh, Flexbox has uh, slightly better support. Um, and uh, did come to, uh, come to IE and uh, the W3C consortium uh, earlier. And when Grid came, it kind of like stole some of that thunder. So I want to talk to you about Flex, because Flex is also a very interesting thing. And because Grid came about a year later than Flex, and people realized that they can make grids really good with CSS Grid, they went, well, this Flex thing is kind of lame. Except for the Flex thing actually isn't super duper lame because there's other things that you can do specifically in Flex that you can't do in anything else. So Flexbox is a flexible content container concept. And so what you're saying is, I've got um, a container of whatever size the browser decides it's going to be. And inside of each of that container, I'm going to give suggestions. Now, that's an interesting thing to think about when you think about layouts, is that you're not actually going to give it if, if, if you're careful, you're not actually going to be giving it hard and fast rules. You're going to be giving it suggestions. So if we do our exact uh, same Riker thing um, in, uh, in Flex, it looks like this. So what we've got is we've got a display Flex. Uh, flex wrap is the thing that's going to be off by default. So Flex is going to just go like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. It's not going to wrap into the next line unless you specifically tell it to. You can also tell it to be uh, column rather than row. Yes, that is, that is how that works. It's column rather than row. Uh, you can also go column reverse, row reverse. Uh, you can do all of that orientation. Um, and the other thing we're going to say is that I want this to have uh, this justify content is going to be space between. So now that we've got um, these uh, rakers inside of here and all of them have their weights, rather than giving them the margin of left and right, we're going to say, you're going to have some empty space. And I want you to just put that in between the elements. However much space there ends up being, put that inside of here. Here's the other thing that I think is really, really neat about flex is that rather than giving this thing a weight, I want to give this thing a flex basis. So I want to say uh, this element itself, this Riker, is going to have a basis of 33% you know, with some extra room for the gap in the middle. And now I'm going to say that I am OK with this thing shrinking if it needs to. You can shrink this thing. I will let you. I will let you as the browser decide if you want to shrink this thing, but I will not let you grow this thing. You can do that to any single element inside of Flex, and it's going to take that thing. You also don't have to use this as a binary value. So for example, you've got a Flex container, and there's a couple things inside of that Flex container, and you want one thing to shrink before the other things. You could give one, thing, we give one of your boxes an element of Flex shrink three, and that will start to shrink before the other elements inside of it. Flex can be used with, uh, with or instead of CSS Grid. I would definitely recommend, in some cases, using both, because there is some things you can do in Flex that you can't do in Grid. For example, if I give a uh, Flex container uh, that's got a uh, display of Flex, I'm going to wrap that thing. I want to do some space between. And now I'm going to so take some items that I don't actually 
easily fit inside of a grid container. They don't have like even gaps between them. And I give those things, uh, and then I give this thing uh, unequal pictures. Like for example, something I look at all the time, which is pictures of Bjork. Then I've got this layout uh, just done inside of Flex. So it's going to say, okay, well, I've got my first element. I've got my second element. I've got my third element. But my fourth element doesn't fix. So I'm going to go ahead and, and, and put that down onto the next row. Now I'm going to gap the things in between. I've got, I'm going to keep going like that, gap that thing in between. You can also go space around. You can do space between. You can center those things. Um, you can take a lot of unequal pieces of content and let those things adjust. Very, very crucially is the idea of vertical centering in Flexbox. In the last 15 years, if you've ever had somebody tell you, oh, we can't, we can't center that thing, that person should have tried harder. <laughs> it has always been possible to do vertical centering in just about every metric that you have. You've never really needed JavaScript before it. And in Flexbox, we can do this. So we can say, I've got my Flex container. And I'm just going to say a line item center. That's going to do the vertical. I'm going to do my justify content. That's going to do the horizontal. And there we go. We've got a, we get a ver, uh, center container, and we're good to go. Uh, in all of these cases, when you want to do this vertical centering, it's right there. This is um, something that, um, you know, I don't, I don't like to throw a whole lot of shade on people. That's not exactly true, but for the premise of this talk, we're going to pretend like it's true. Um, but I came across this article um, uh, on Medium at one point, and that's an insane headline. That is an insane headline. Think about that. That we are in, uh, we are in the very end of a month where we we were about halfway done with the year, and somebody's going to tell you there are nine different CSS and JS libraries, and you should learn all of them right now. That's insane, and if you are the kind of person that wants to put your CSS in JavaScript, I'm not saying I approve, but it's okay. If you want to do that thing, if you want to put your CSS inside of JavaScript, I don't think that's really ever the right method, but it's okay. But if you are doing that thing, I want to talk to you for just a moment about the cascade. CSS, of course, stands for Cascading Style Sheets, and the cascade is the most important element in there, and it's the thing that Tailwind said Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> so inside of CSS is the cascade, and that works with the following rules. So the cascade is individual rules calculated in order of increasing specificity, with IDs getting extreme priority, only beat by inline styles, and important being the nuclear option. So that would mean that if I've got uh, a whole bunch of properties, and those properties disagree with each other, which is what will always happen inside of CSS. So I've got my, my base background color of, of white and my, and my base foreground color of black, and then I start to get cuter. So first of all, those things are going to go in order. So the first CSS rule th that will get beat by the second CSS rule. But then it's about increasing specificity. So if I've got a P that's inside of an article, then that's going to win over a rule that's just a P. If I'm styling an ID, um, then it's going to win in nearly all cases. In order to beat that, you'd have to have like 100, literally 100 different CSS classes to beat that thing. Um, then you can beat that thing with inline styles. If you've got something that's styled with an ID, First of all, maybe try to refactor that code because that got a little bit weird at some point. But if you've got, if you, if somebody's still on an ID, uh, you can beat that with inline styles. And if you do have to do important, and you know, I've been doing this job for a, a while, I do end up doing this. But what I would recommend to you is that if you use any sort of like, like for example, I use SAS, but if you use any sort of like concept of different style sheets, what I would recommend to you is to do a file, and I mean this. I mean this as a genuine good practice. Create a file called shame.css. You had to make something. You had a deadline. That deadline was tomorrow. You had to write code that you went, ooh, that's not great. If you create a file called, called shame.css and you mark that thing in there, that is now highlighted as something that you need to get to for the lifespan of the product. So with these rules, and we look at this thing, OK, so here is our uh, HTML. And then here is our uh, 
CSS. So now we've got some rules that are conflicting with each other. Obviously, we've got a background color, which could be green or blue or, uh, uh, let's see, there's a foreground. We got guesses on these? Now again, there's a couple things we have to factor is that it's the order of what happens, then it's the specificity, so A is going to beat, or A.link is going to beat just an A, that ID is going to beat something else. I'm going to give you just a sec if you've got a guess, and then, is anybody right? Close? Close? It is getting to the end of the day. All right, all right, I get it, I get it. Um, if you're looking at these specific things and you're surprised by this, then one of the things that I would definitely recommend is just to open this thing up in the Web Inspector itself. Now, um, as, as, uh, as I've mentioned before, the, uh, the market share of, of Chrome is huge. Um, if you've uh, ever uh, downloaded uh, Firefox, uh, Firefox actually has a Web Inspector that's fantastic. But what I can look inside of, of this in any browser is I can just look at the rules of, of any property that I have here, scroll through, and I'll start to find out what wins. If you're ever confused about, like, why is this thing not happening, this is, this is frequently what I'm doing with junior developers. Let's open this thing up in Web Inspector, let's see this code, and let's figure out exactly why this thing's happening. I want to give you some takeaways here, and, um, and one of those things uh, is a game. Uh, it's a game that uh, I think is really well made, um, and also, that's the wrong clicker. Where did I put the right clicker? Where was my clicker? That's, I'm stupid. Um, if, we, uh, if we look here at uh, CSS Diner, um, so I think that this, this is a very neat project. So this is a uh, game that was made by Flukeout. And really, all it is is just about figuring out the specificity of elements. So for example, um, we want to select the plates. So we want to select just the plates. OK, awesome. So I'm going to just select the plates. Ooh. Ooh. I am having that thing where I'm presenting and suddenly am dumb at typing. OK, so now we've got a plate, and, we've only, and now we've got, uh, we want to select just the bento boxes. So the bento boxes and not the plates, we're going to do that. Now, in, in, these, uh, in these, see what I said about being bad at typing all of a sudden? Um, in this case, you're going to get more and more complicated and get more and more specific about the elements that you're trying to pick up. For example, we want to do the fancy plate, so we're going to do a plate with an uh, ID of fancy. Um, and there is, you know, I think there's around about, oh, there's 32 different levels to this thing. And I think that this was uh, something that was really, really well thought out as a way to just select the specific elements that you're trying to change. Um, another thing uh, that I would rec recommend to you is uh, Flexbox Froggy. Uh, Flexbox Froggy uh, was a game made by Thomas H. Park. And uh, same general kind of concept, where you've got these instructions of, for example, a, um, a, we've got a frog, and we want to put the frog on a lily pad. So we know that the pond is a, uh, is a flex element. So now we're going to go uh, justify content flex end. And there he goes. He's on a lily pad. Um, so same thing, you're going to have about 24 different levels to kind of arrange these sort of things. Um, and, and by the end, uh, the, the tutorial will kind of like keep you through and uh, help you understand a little bit about this uh, Flexbox layout. Um, from the very same person is Grid Garden. I'm not going to open up this one because suddenly I'm just really awful at typing. Uh, <laughs> but you're going to have a situation where uh, I've got my, uh, my plants and I want to water all of those plants. And so you're going to use uh, CSS Grid in order to distribute uh, your water to the plants. Uh, CodePen is a fantastic, fantastic resource uh, for so many things. Uh, CodePen was made by Chris Coyer and a group of about three or four other people. Um, uh, this Chris Coyer was the guy that also started CSS Tricks. And so you can look at, for example, situations of CSS only blank and see some pretty damn amazing examples 
and so, I mean, this is actually just a live uh, thing, but for example, like that's, you can look at situations where there's no JavaScript there. Like that is, that is entirely the result of CSS. Finally, uh, if you do uh, uh, go down this rabbit hole and find yourself really wanting to do uh, fillier things with CSS, what I would recommend is a game called CSS Battle. So CSS Battle is a global uh, competition uh, for CSS. And what happens is that you will have challenges where you will need to, for example, draw like this skeleton or this uh, uh, the skull and crossbones using only CSS. But here's the thing, it's golf score. So each and every character that you have is going to add to your score. So you want to try to make this drawing, but with as few characters as possible. That means that, number one, you get to learn about CSS. Number two, you get to learn how fault tolerant it is. Like, it is amazing how bad you can do of writing HTML and still have that thing render into a browser. I'm hoping that by the end of this, and again, I want, to, I want to touch you all with my love of CSS. It really is my favorite language. But I'm hoping that over all this time, you've thought of a language like this, and you move into a language that seems useful and cool and impressive and beautiful. Because in my mind, CSS is all of those things. Uh, these gifts were all made possible by uh, Lynn Fisher of Lynn and Tonic, one of my favorite CSS developers. Lynn and Tonic, uh, Nestflix, um, uh, she did a, a site of uh, Top Chef and another site of um, uh, the uh, Schitt's Creek. Uh, it's all of the sweaters that are in Schitt's Creek. Um, uh, and that is my talk. Thank you so much. I am uh, hanging out. I mean, I know that there is, uh, there's one more talk coming up here, but I also know that uh, all of us as developers love stickers. And if you are interested in uh, a lemon sticker, uh, please come and get yourself one or two or five or however many you like. And if you'd like to have a conversation with me about CSS, about flat file CMSs, uh, please do. Thanks again. <laughs>